I am Sanjita Das from the National Institutes of Health, and today I'll be talking about bird flu, highly pathogenic avian influenza, or the H5N1 variant of influenza, as you call it. Social media, scientific media, popular media, wherever you go, you have all seen news about these devastating infection with H5N1 in mammals. Uh, be it the feline species, mountain lions, and especially devastating is this catastrophic mortality in the southern elephant seals and also off the coast, the Pacific uh, Northwest of the US. And you see these that at the breeding groups at peak season, they were record, all were recorded dead. So what's going on? We find out that there's another novel zoonotic viruses. Now, when I say another novel zoonotic virus, uh, we know that emerging zoonotic viruses are not new. We have known them for over a century. Now, conservative estimates are that about 60% of all novel emerging viruses have a zoonotic origin. And it is called a spillover or a host jump or a zoonotic transfer because it, they are adapted to a particular species and then they jump that species and come over to another species and adapt themselves. It is a very complex and multifactorial process. And at the center of it, as you can imagine, is the environment. And then of course there is the host and the organism. And as the human species encroach more and more upon the animal, animal environment, there is more and more chances of this host jumping happening. The organisms will adapt to a new mammalian host and, and then they may or may not be able to sustain infection. Uh, HIV, for example, has sustained infection but was originally a zoonotic transfer. And then, of course, we see these little out, small outbreaks of viruses that you know about, such as Nipah viruses, come up a little bit and then uh, they sort of peter away or keep in a certain particular uh, um, environmental area. So to talk about the avian flu or the H5N1, um, this is also not new. We have known this for several decades now. So it first came up in 1996-97 in a domestic fowl in China. And at that time, it started off with about 18 human cases, but then it went off to more than 800 cases. And what was very concerning was the 50% death rate among the humans that did get infected. And then, lo and behold, it went away. So uh, we didn't hear about it for another almost six years. Then it came back in 2003 to 2005. And in this time, this, this time when it reemerged, it actually spread. And it spread to other countries in Asia, but also via migratory birds, it spread to Africa, Middle East, and Europe. And then again, for almost two decades, we do not, do not hear anything about this virus. And then we do see other iterations of the H and N variants uh, that come up in, in, in different avian species. There are some uh, infection humans. But then in 2020, we see the emergence of what we call as highly pathogenic avian influenza. Of course, there is, of course, a low pathogenic avian influenza. But H5N1, which is a little bit of a resortant with H5N8, has been seen to be highly pathogenic avian influenza. Not only that, it adapted to wild birds and it was identified in different continents. One year later, in 2021, it was first seen in North America in, um, in, in Newfoundland in aquatic birds and then there was an explosive expansion all across North America. And this was the emergence of the clade that we are seeing right now, that is 2.3.4.4b. It's a resortant, as I said before. And what is most important is that it is is being seen in mammals. It is causing severe neurological involvement in mammals. And not only has it spread in mammals, peridomestic um, um, mammalian feline species, it is also being seen now in dairy cows. So what's going on? Um, when it first got into North America in the aquatic birds and in the wild birds, there was a study done to see if there was any genetic change in this virus when it came over to North America. So here I'm showing you, um, it's a segmented virus. So all the segments are being shown here on the left-hand side um, of the chart. And um, they are comparing here the uh, genome from the wild bird 
to that from the aquatic bird. So Wigeon is an aquatic bird. I had to look that up. And then um, there are wild birds like eagle, hawk, eagle. Um, and then if you look at the different uh, genomic seg segments, you see that in the aquatic birds, they are all from the Eurasian lineage, which is being shown in orange here and below in the phylogenetic tree. Whereas in the wild birds, you see that there is a genetic genotypic diversity, that some segments are from the North American lineage and some segments are from the Eurasian lineage. So what happened? Is this reassortment or the genetic recombination giving us a more virulent virus? On the right hand side, you see this from the same study where they infected ferrets with the, both the aquatic bird uh, virus and uh, from the wild bird. And they showed that in days post inoculation, again, the orange line you see up top is the one from uh, Eurasian lineage, and the blue line is from the North American lineage. And the North American lineage was definitely highly more pathogenic and caused death in ferrets within 10 days, whereas the, um, the Eurasian lineage wasn't as um, infectious. So now the next question is what happens in the dairy cows? So that study has also been done. And uh, there was a, uh, a, a genotypic um, uh, evaluation done in all the dairy cow viruses that have so far been isolated. And this was published in uh, NEJM in May. And here you can see the phylogenetic tree, which is almost like a molecular clock showing you where the dairy cattle viruses are, as opposed to the other uh, different mammalian species, as you can see raccoons, humans, skunks, etc. And you see here that all the dairy cow isolates that are um, shown in blue, they cluster together with a few other uh, mammalian species interspersed in between. This kind of a phylogenetic tree is consistent with a single introduction of the virus into the cows. And that is the clade that we are now seeing, genotype B3.13 of the clade 2.3.4.4b. Now, there are a few things that, uh, that still don't quite add up. Uh, we are seeing this, this genotypic um, uh, variant in all cows, but some of the times we see that there is no epidemiological link between the dairy cows that are showing this, uh, this variant. So are there affected herds that have not yet been identified? Or is there movement of asymptomatic cattle? Because as you know that dairy cows uh, cannot uh, be moved until they have been tested and have been deemed negative. Uh, the herds are not being moved from state to state or from, um, from place to place. Um, but but uh, so is there any movement with asymptomatic cattle and have they played a role? And then finally, um, while other mammals do appear to be dead and host, it looks like the bovine species can spread from bovine to bovine, and in some cases, even to humans. So this is the current situation. It's a few days old, but um, I checked last night and it hasn't changed too much. Um, but anyway, we do know that it's widespread in wild birds and it's causing uh, infection in dairy cows. But more importantly, there are three human cases. So what about these human cases? They, are in two, they have been identified in two states, Texas and Michigan. Um, and interestingly, we see more conjunctivitis than respiratory um, symptoms, at least in the first two cases. The third case did show some respiratory symptoms, but they did find lower levels of viral RNA in the NP swabs. The nasopharyngeal swabs did not show as much virus as the conjunctival swabs did. So it is postul being postulated that perhaps there is tracking of virus through the nasolacrimal duct, duct or uh, it, it, that is not actually uh, establishing infection in the respiratory tract. And genetically, this is very close to the avian influenza. Um, and and uh, the one good piece of news is that uh, these are all avian uh, influenza viruses. They have uh, low, prevalent, uh, low predilection uh, to the silic acid residues that are present in humans. So um, what do we know? We know that there is no documented human-to-human -human spread in the U.S. with this genotype so far. Um, uh, we do, do also know that the cu current antiviral treatment available for influenza is going to be effective against this virus uh, that has been shown in studies. We also know that, um, that in cows, there is definitely, the, while they show uh, you know, mild symptoms, um, there is a decreased production of milk, and so that is going to affect uh, the, the milk industry for sure. Uh, 
And while pasteurization and um, heat treatment does reduce the viral load significantly in milk, the, in, in raw milk, the virus does keep alive. And it has been shown that for up to seven days, the virus will be alive in, in, in raw milk. So this is all we do know. And, and feeding of raw milk to bab sea mice has caused death. Now, what don't we know? Uh, we know that perhaps the uh, PCR assays that are now available and are FDA approved will work for the most part, but that has not been, um, you know, the, the performance characteristic, for example, has not been completely um, uh, evaluated in all the platforms that are out there. And uh, for the most part, you will probably see an untypable influenza virus when you do get an H5N1 that you are testing among the currently available diagnostic assays. So make sure you, you, uh, you, you think about H5N1 if the symptoms are, are suggestive of it, because a negative result may not indicate a completely negative test. Antigen tests, we still don't know the performance characteristics, and there are some suggestions that this might also have low sensitivity. So, and then most importantly, this is a virus that mutates and resorts and genetic changes may, may be possible. So we still don't know, while at this point it does not have, pose any threat to the human life, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we have to be vigilant.